Thank you. Um, so this is work of my student, uh, Jing Q, who's uh, working summer job today. Um, so the challenge that we're trying to address is that uh, there's a tremendous uh, growth of applications of deep, deep networks. Um, these networks are in many ways quite different from uh, machine learning models that we've used in the past. Um, unlike a lot of traditional models, a machine learning network, uh, excuse me, a deep network, doesn't necessarily embody a theory or a, a structure of the data being analyzed or a phenomenon in, in nature. Um, at best, it's a general purpose function approximator. Um, and it may be weakly structured in, in ways that seem to transcend um, its application. So the most important one of those is, is just hierarchical structure, which uh, seems to mirror a lot of phenomena in nature that have some kind of um, hierarchy of scale, hierarchy of uh, physical processes. And um, the phenomenon of deep networks has been uh, greatly driven by, by the depth of the network, the fact that people have been able to train these networks up to hundreds of these represent representational layers. Um, uh, for images, there's, there's weak structure. There's shift invariance uh, in image analysis, so you get convolutional networks. Um, and there are a few other design patterns that, that cut across the networks, but basically uh, what would have been the, the model itself is embedded in the learned weights of the network instead of being somehow explicit in its structure. So that makes it a lot harder to interpret what happens in the network. Um, <clears throat> specifically uh, for this work, we're interested in making driving models interpretable. Um, and there are advantages to designing driving models uh, using deep networks that work end to end. So they work all the way from the image pixels uh, in a camera or sensor in front of the vehicle all the way to the uh, steering and acceleration and braking controls. Um, that end-to-end -end control um, allows the controller to deal with situations that would be very hard to describe explicitly. Um, so I'll say more about that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and there's a, a, a commercial interest in this, which is we like people to feel comfortable and safe and uh, to understand what the vehicle is doing. So explanations in this context um, hopefully will help people build trust in the controllers. Um, also probably better help them anticipate uh, what the vehicle would do in a given situation um, in case they want to overrule what it's likely to do. Uh, and more generally, we'd like to facilitate communication between people and the vehicles that they're driving in. Um, and ideally, we'd like to move towards hands-free, ideally voice-based and uh, uh, speech recognition-based interfaces, since those uh, allow people to do other things in the vehicle, which they would generally like to do. All right, so, <coughs> um, so here are some supposedly real examples from uh, a corpus of uh, actual explanations of accident. Um, they're worth reading. I collided with a stationary tram car coming the other way. Um, I didn't think the speed limit uh, uh, applied after midnight, etc. So um, these are humorous, but there's actually a, a genuine message behind them, which is um, people, when they give explanations of their own behavior, human beings are uh, often extremely biased. Generally, there's an attribution bias. If you did a bad thing, it's your fault. If I did a bad thing, it's also your fault somehow. Um, so, um, and, and there's more depth to this. There are famous experiments by Schachter showing that if you actually biologically induce some emotional state um, in, a, in a user or exaggerate a state in a, a subject, then the subject will explain uh, their state in terms of external causes, even though uh, there were uh, chemical internal causes that caused the state that they were not aware of. And they will actually believe their explanation. So um, you know, this is one of the things that people uh, cognitively hallucinate. We hallucinate that we understand why we do things, but in fact, we have very limited ability to introspect. So all of this is to say that it's very difficult to get ground truth uh, in terms of even why human drivers actually do things. Um, in the cases we're going to be looking at, there'll be uh, obvious uh, stimuli such as stop signs. So it's not as subtle as some of these issues, but it's worth keeping these in mind. Um, oh, and by the way, in case you're worried about running into drivers on these roads, they're all from England, so you don't have to worry unless you go to uh, Great Britain. 
Um, OK, so there's been a lot of work on making um, image-based networks interpretable. Uh, the great thing about image-based networks is that they have, you know, they're derived from images, and all of the intermediate layers in the network have a spatial structure, so they can easily be rendered um, as spatial activations. And they're pretty intuitive. These are different layers of uh, convolutional network. Um, the actual activations are shown. Let's see, which one is the pointer? Oh, yeah. Um, this is a map of actual activations. These are uh, chunks of image that maximally activate a given neuron. Uh, and both of them help you understand what's going on. You can, you'll see a hierarchy of low-level features through middle and higher level features uh, through to things like wheels and heads and so on. Um, so that's quite intuitive. <coughs> um, and uh, we don't directly leverage that work, but we, we do something that's inspired by that work. Another area where people have uh, had some success in interpreting uh, this time controllers is in looking at um, clusterings of uh, deep network activations. So. Uh, this is a, well, we can't see the network, but there's, there's a network <coughs> behind this visualization that's been trained to play the game of breakout. And you can see some sample games. Um, so each state of a game is associated with one of the points in this visualization. It's a T-SNE embedding, so it's a, a two-dimensional embedding of the high-dimensional uh, set of activations. So all of the uh, cell intensities, the cell uh, strengths, not, not the weights, but the actual activations of all this, the neurons in the network have been embedded, treating them as points in Euclidean space. They've been embedded in the 2D space in a way that roughly preserves uh, proximity. So generally, uh, points that are close together in the visualization have very similar activations. So you'd expect them to, um, you know, for images, you'd expect the image, images to look similar. Uh, this is a control policy network, so when points are similar, it means that the network's likely to be uh, doing something similar uh, or treating the images in a similar way. So it embeds some of the control similarity as well as the <coughs> um, input similarity. And um, yeah, you, you, if you look closely, you can find that the, uh, the points correspond to different stages in the game and, and often different strategy, uh, strategies where the uh, player is explicitly trying to break one of the corners and get through uh, to get to the next level. So anyway, um, so there, there's interesting work. Finally, um, a last piece of relevant work is uh, work on driving control where the convolutional network is doing part of the work. It's doing perceptual work, and it's identifying uh, directly interpretable features like distance from the vehicle in front. Um, centeredness in the lane that you're in, and distance from the curb, and so on. So um, from these parameters, um, you can compare uh, what the perceptual network says back with the images and see if you agree with its interpretation. Uh, so you can sort of diagnose the convolutional network. And um, given these quantitative measures of uh, spacing and so on, you can uh, implement various types of controller, rule-based controller, or uh, a continuous controller that um, embeds certain properties so you can prove properties about the controller. Um, so it's kind of a hybrid system where you can apply um, formal verification methods over here, but your CNN is doing the perception. So, um, so we we're not doing this, um, uh, although we are moving towards a hybrid of this with end-to-end -end control. So with end-to-end -end control, which is coming up in a, uh, a slide or two, uh, this both CNN and the driving controller are uh, convolutional networks, or they're parts of the same network. And um, the signals passing between them are just latent states or activations of the network. So we don't assume that these uh, explicitly interpretable uh, signals exist, although uh, if we have a, an appropriate data set, which we recently got access to, we will try to, um, we will try to learn uh, nodes in the graph that have these given signals, uh, which is easy to do if you have the labels. Um, 
and but in addition we'll allow a unrestricted latent state to pass across as well because there are many situations where there's no lane markings it's not clear where the curb is uh, it's not clear where the vehicle in front if it has a load sticking out it's not clear where that vehicle ends and begins um, and deep networks can you know learn various representations of those difficult conditions and drive effectively in those cases so um, we we're interested in working in hybrids but for now we're just doing the end-to-end -end model okay <coughs> so uh, there there is a science of explanations uh, within psychology um, and our colleague Tanya Lombroso uh, is one of the experts in this one of the leaders um, and one of the findings, uh, the high level finding is that uh, when people are explaining or being explained to <coughs> about physical or mechanical systems, they prefer causal explanations. So in, in terms of what the vehicle's doing, it's slowing because there's a stop sign and we hope that it actually stops at the stop sign, although that doesn't always happen. Um, and that's an implicit counterfactual explanation. Okay, so it's very succinct, but it doesn't really capture what the person actually means. What the person actually means is that uh, it slowed when the stop sign was there, or it slowed because the stop sign was there, and if there was no stop sign, it would have done something different. Okay? That's what you implicitly mean if you say, I did something because of X. It's, a, it's an implied counterfactual uh, on the absence of that stimulus. Um, okay, so that's important. We'll, we'll come back to that um, soon because we like to mimic that behavior in the network. Okay. Um, so <coughs> uh, the first thing we have done is worked on uh, visual explanations and we're taking advantage again of the fact that the input to this network is visual. So it's a video stream um, from the front of the vehicle and um, we can uh, explain its behavior in terms of what uh, particular parts of the image the model is attending to. So, um, and some of you might have seen attention models in deep networks. Uh, it's a remarkable design motif that allows you to in inject a kind of a spatial filter in a convolutional network um, that, given an uh, initial image here, uh, forms a weight map across the image and basically disregards large chunks of the input image. And it decides how to do that uh, based on an unrelated task. So uh, this um, controller takes the video stream in. It has human data on steering and driving as a regression signal. So it learns to fit um, the human steering angle. Uh, there's actually some other steps that we do because we want it to actually follow a course but for simplicity let's assume it's just tracking a, a regression signal which is the steering and uh, acceleration signal and uh, but in the course of doing that task it actually learns um, almost magically that it can ignore large chunks of the image and it learns appropriate uh, mappings to do that and it it's using only the control signal the regression signal and if you look closely, you'll find that the, uh, this is a multiplying node. It's just multiplying together the um, attention map and the input, uh, the processed input image. But um, during gradient optimization, that, um, that multiplication, the gradient here that goes into the attention network, in other words, the signal that the attention map learns is the product of activation and, and gradient. Uh, back propagating through the multiplier. Um, it means that it's being encouraged to favor areas of the image that are strongly activated uh, when the output is saying, you know, increase uh, this, in, this input. That signal enough is enough to learn these kind of attention maps. So <coughs> um, attention maps are very interesting because uh, they tell us that um, when the vehicle was doing a particular control action, it was ignoring the parts of the image that are uh, blue in this, in this image here. Blue means that there's almost no weight applied to those parts of the image. So uh, it's a, a ground truth for uh, negatives um, as far as po potential stimuli that influence the output behavior. Um, but it's not 
uh, necessary and sufficient. It's only ground truth for negatives, not for positives. Or in other words, um, there may be uh, regions that it attends to uh, that are not actually affecting the output. And that's very natural. Um, attention, you know, you, you can attend to things that are potentially important, and you should attend to things that are potentially important, but they may actually not be important. You, the, and for instance, the system will often look uh, to the side of the road if there's foliage or any uh, texturing at the edges of the image where there might be signs. Um, it'll sort of look at those by applying attention heat and then decide that there's no signage there and then ignore them. So, <coughs> um, but we, what we want in a visual explanation is a causal explanation. Uh, so we want to be able to say that uh, let's say for this vehicle here that the um, <coughs> what the controller did was influenced by the vehicle. So in other words, if the uh, perhaps the vehicle slowed down, perhaps it it veered to the right because of that stimulus, um, and we'd like to verify that if that chunk of attention, if that object in the image were not there, that it would do something different. So the way we do that is we do some clustering of these uh, of the heat maps. We just cluster the heat map. We don't actually look down at the pixels to see what objects are under the, uh, the heat map uh, regions. We use the fact that it tends to uh, form high activation blobs over areas of the image that contain objects. So it's a shortcut realistically, but it allows us to get a small number of sort of uh, area hypotheses that we can then basically turn off <coughs> one at a time. Uh, and check whether uh, the controller changes its output uh, in that counterfactual situation. And attention maps are nice because they allow you to basically turn off areas of the image without actually figuring out what the, the corresponding real image would look like. So I can turn a blob off here in the attention layer, and the network downstream has already been trained to um, make sense of all kinds of masks views of the input image. So if I mask out a little bit more, it doesn't really affect its accuracy downstream. Um, if you look back at the pixels, and these images are hard to see, but if, if you think of trying to remove a stop sign from the image, I'd actually have to fill in the background in order to not create an image of something else, like a big black zone where the stop sign would be would be something strange. It wouldn't be just a, it wouldn't be nothing, it would be something. But anyway, the, uh, doing the masking the attention map layer allows us to uh, try each of these uh, blobs in turn and figure out which ones actually have causal influence on the output. So um, yeah, this is perhaps not, I don't think I want to get into this. I mean, we can, well, <coughs> what's happening here is that we're applying different um, regularization on the attention maps. We can make the attention maps more selective by regularizing them a bit more aggressively, saying make, you know, uh, forcing them to be more sparse. The trouble is that when you make the actual attention more sparse, it misses more important stimuli and the, the driving accuracy degrades. Um, by contrast, if you use fairly coarse attention, um, the accuracy for, for the driving control accuracy is actually slightly better than without attention. So by inserting the attention into the model, we're actually not not costing any performance, and we're slightly improving it. But only if we're, we're modest in uh, how selective we force the attention map to be. If we try to make it too selective, it doesn't work. But the nice thing about the causal filtering is that uh, it's, it's kind of not in line. Um, we're not actually changing the attention heat map that's used to control the vehicle. We're doing a post hoc check. So uh, we can use a fairly busy attention map for control, and then the filtered attention map is is uh, more interpretable and more sparse. So this next, uh, not quite that one, this one. Um, so what you see here are the unfiltered attention maps, and these are filtered maps. And they actually look a lot, uh, well, in some ways they look busier, because you can see some very strong um, red regions here. Uh, what, what's perhaps misleading about that is that these are actually the same intensity as these uh, um, the maximum of these regions on the left, but the image normalization is different. So, um, yeah, it's not quite. We, there's actually a lot more uh, total attention weight over here, and this one's a lot more selective in what areas that it emphasizes. 
So roughly speaking, we uh, cut down the, the area of the image that's uh, attention attended to by about 60% uh, with this approach. And as I mentioned, the, the driving accuracy is not degraded by doing this. All right, so we'll try to speed up a bit <coughs> and finish on time. So, uh, at the, so the result here is that we create a live animation of a, a attention heat, and I'll show a, a video of that before I finish. Uh, but we really wanted textual explanations. And okay, so we'd like to produce, a, first of all, a description, uh, and then an explanation of what's happening. Um, because it, an explanation uh, without the context of what's being explained can often be confusing. It may not be obvious to the user what the vehicle is trying to explain. So we, we always include a description of what the vehicle did and a, a, a corresponding explanation of why it did it. Um, okay, so <coughs> at, at high level, we have the same vehicle controller that creates um, an attention map of the image. Um, we also build an explanation generator that takes the same video input stream. It also is aware of the control output from the controller, so it can see if the controller is slowing down or speeding up, etc. Uh, and um, just as the vehicle controller benefits from using attention, um, an explanation generator can be designed to use its own attention map so that when it, when it says, I slowed down beca because of a stop sign, it should emphasize the stop sign. And in fact, it will do that. So, uh, so in this combined design, we actually have two attention maps, um, one for the controller and one for the, for the uh, explainer. And uh, we add a loss or an error term uh, that it encourages the uh, explanation to be guided or to be grounded in what the vehicle was actually looking at. So and that generally gives us improved uh, explanation. One problem we have, though, is that our training data, so, sorry, we, uh, in order to do this, we use a data set that has sequences of images, uh, descriptions of what a human, uh, all right, let me, let me explain this. So um, our original data set is just dashboard video <coughs> um, from uh, real vehicles driving around in San Francisco. Uh, there are action descriptions and justifications generated by uh, users in Mechanical Turk who look at these videos and then try to explain. So these are not um, actual explanations from the drivers at, in, in real time driving the vehicle. They're third party explanations by humans. So they're actually already rationalizations. Um, so really what they are is the, ki the rationale or the stimulus that a typical human driver would have attended to. Um, that's not obviously worse than uh, introspective explanations. Uh, especially because we have several of them for each uh, uh, video. Um, but it is, worth, it is worth that caveat that we, we don't have access to anything approaching ground truth, which makes the evaluation of the explanations tricky. So grounding them generally produces explanations that appear to look better in terms of the, the visual stimulus. Um, but uh, again, a human driver isn't ground truth anyway, even if you did have their, a true explanation of what they're attending to, because what we're trying to do is explain what the model attended to. Uh, and in particular, we want to highlight differences. And we've seen several differences. These models, for instance, don't attend to pedestrians very well. Um, that seems to be because the pedestrians are actually not directly causal stimuli in most of the videos. They tend to cross in front of the vehicle at stop signs or stop lights where the stop sign or stoplight is the primary cue. So they have very little causal impact. Um, all right, so I think the network design is, is too much detail. The high levels are that the control is sort of a more or less disconnected system up here. The explainer's down here, only the control signals. Uh, sorry, uh, this is, yeah, the, all right. The attention from the controller is passed down, the control signals are passed down, and then there's a loss between the uh, attention maps. So that's enough intuition, I think. I won't go through all that. All right. <coughs> um, uh, we, we, without going into details, we try a couple of different types of alignment of attention maps. Uh, strongly aligned attention means we actually, uh, they actually do share the same attention. So the explanation is driven directly by the uh, spatial attention of the controller. Uh, in weakly aligned attention, the uh, explanation module 
uh, constructs its own attention map, but it's uh, joined by a loss to the controller's uh, loss. And rationalization, you just run the explainer without any um, introspection on what the control model is doing. So you can generate those three types of explanation. Um, yeah, so we, we get slightly better scores, interestingly enough, uh, versus human data when we do ground the explanations. There's no particular reason to expect that, but, but it does happen. Um, and yeah, let me just do the videos and then I'll stop for questions. Okay, so here's a typical example. This will, uh, oh, I always do this, sorry. Um, okay. This needs this step requires glasses. Okay, history. There is second bar. Okay. Okay. Um, this is just the input data. Okay, you might go bigger. <coughs> All right. So this is just acceleration uh, control signals. Um, in a second, we'll see attention. So this is the controller's attention map. Uh, this one's not filtered causally, um, so it's pretty busy. Uh, so you'll see it attending high to where there's lights or signage. It uh, tries to track lanes um, and generally vehicles, although if it has lanes, it doesn't pay much attention to the vehicles. All right, and this is the explanation module. It has its own, a different map which is driven by what it's trying to explain at the moment. And I guess for this model there, let's see, human annotator said <coughs> car accelerates because traffic light turns green. Uh, we said car accelerates because light turns green and traffic is moving. So um, yeah, the grounding, it's a little hard to see how the grounding works uh, because it's a bit indirect. but. But generally, the weakly aligned attention works better, which means having the two separate attention maps uh, grounded together. I guess I, w I did. There was one other thing I was going to say, and then I'll stop. Um, basically, what we're trying to do now is take the same data and generate advice to the system. So we have, because we have this uh, text that's grounded in the images, we can use it to recognize states such as stop signs or red lights, and we can also learn to um, inject control using the text into the system. So the idea is to go from just explaining what the vehicle is doing, but to having some influence over it, uh, it w using similar language. All right, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, Pearl recently brought out a new book where he discusses um, causality. Um, Who did? I'm sorry. Uh, Pearl. Pearl. You did Pearl. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so he suggests that, that um, neural nets are essentially glorified function fitters and that we need to think much more carefully about the way we teach machines about causality. Uh, do you agree? Do you have thoughts on this? Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that there's a common criticism that uh, neural networks can only um, uh, learn functions. However, if you configure them properly, they can learn to generate uh, arbitrary functions and they do a better job currently than generative models uh, they, you can also do uh, Bayesian parameter estimation across neural networks. So th th it's not really a limitation. It's, it's th th when used in the simplest possible fashion, yes, they have limitations. Um, we, yeah, we didn't directly try to learn causal relationships, but um, you can, you know, if you think about it, one, one nice thing about this network is that it allowed us to do uh, more or less a, a, a pretty genuine causal in or counterfactual intervention on the image stream um, because we benefited from having the attention map layer and we didn't have to do a true counterfactual synthesis of, of artificial images. Um, so 
you know, ne networks, are, you know, attention maps allow you to do that more generally. If you have attention, you can change the, the, the uh, what's happening in the world by masking certain things out. So, I don't know, I, I, I don't think that's really a fundamental limitation. I agree that it's important to think about causality, so, but, but I don't think there's really fundamental limitations here. Thank you so much, John, for coming here, for being a bit data, a data science senior, and uh, all these great tools. I mean, started with the, the Canny filter that so many of us are uh, very familiar with, to these new technologies. About this new technology, I'm curious to, know, to learn about uh, the, uh, the controller's attentional heat map, and if there were any compares when you mentioned the human, if that's actually compared with uh, Maps, salience maps obtained through saccadic movements, tracking of saccadic movements uh, using humans in psychophysical experiments. Yes. Um, so my, my students been uh, doing some of that work. So I, I do have some videos of that, um, which um, I should have tried to. Uh, um, shoot. Um, so right now they're. Um, yeah, he's doing some work right now with some colleagues um, in uh, vision science to try to figure out if um, I information on human gaze can be used to uh, better guide the machine attention maps. And so far, there's not an obvious po a gain from doing that. Um, human attention is also quite different uh, from these simple attention models in that it's a, a graduated attention. It's not all or nothing, it's um, higher resolution, but it's also higher sensitivity to motion in the periphery. Uh, so generally speaking, the machine attention maps are uh, busier and sort of more, what's the word, uh, more diffuse. The human attention maps tend to be a lot more focused on key parts of the image, uh, part, you know, because they're actually able to um, recognize uh, or, or they're able to detect important things in the periphery if they need to. Um, but they're also uh, attending to a lot of things other than driving, typically. You know, they're interested in pedestrians and other things happening on the sidewalk um, when they're sitting at the stoplights and the vehicle just doesn't do any of that. So there's quite a few differences, and one has to be a bit careful that, uh, you know, in, in trying to use the human gaze signal to help the vehicle, that the, the human is multitasking across many tasks that are not driving. So. But, but he's continuing to do that. Any, any more questions? Do, do you want to use the microphone? Um, so the, yeah, the network runs very, it runs quite a, a lot faster than real time, the controller network. Um, the causal filtering, I think, is pretty close. It may not be quite real time. Um, but yeah, the, uh, that particular network is a simplified um, Alex net, and it's uh, it's several hundred frames a second. Actually, yeah, at least that much. That's as fast as we can run it. I mean, th I'm assuming that you have a GPU, but there are these embedded GPUs that that most of the self-driving vehicles have, you know, a few teraflops in them. So um, thank you so much, John. For this great talk, and thanks okay. all the speakers from the second morning session. And I believe there's lunch ready now.